So I um, want to give just sort of a really brief introduction to what computer science is sort of all about uh, and a little bit of the history um, of it. And uh, uh, then we'll talk kind of some other stuff after this. So, so this is a ultra brief, ultra incomplete history of the, of the discipline. Um, one might argue that computer science starts in ancient times. So has anybody ever seen or heard of this thing? The Antikythera mechanism? Yeah, so <clears throat> this was a mechanical thing that uh, got sort of discovered randomly uh, in the early 1900s by some pearl divers off the island of Antikythera in, the, uh, uh, in Greece, the Aegean Ocean. And they found a shipwreck uh, of, you know, from, you know, ancient times. Uh, the dating of it is, there's a lot of argument about that, but roughly speaking, somewhere between 200 BC and 100 or 200 AD, kind of in that time frame. Um, and there's arguments for, you know, uh, why it, uh, the, the dating is in that, that range. Um, so, it's been sitting in the ocean basically for 2000 years. So it's corroded and broken and, and horrible condition and whatnot. Um, and uh, it's very clearly some sort of mechanical thing. I mean, you can see gears and stuff. So you x-ray it, you do things like that and you can see underneath all this corrosion, a bunch of gears. And then the question is, well, what the hell is it supposed to do? Um, that is partly explained because on the side, there was actually an instruction manual um, spoiler alert, it was written in ancient Greek, so you better be up on your ancient Greek. Uh, so what it turns out that this thing did was it was an astronomical calculator. And so it would tell you basically when the eclipses would occur and where in the, uh, the zodiac, the sun and the moon were and, uh, the positions of the planets and things like that. Now, what's so brilliant about it is what was the model of the cosmos in ancient times? Yeah, the Earth was at the center of the known universe, and the cosmological model, the mathematical model that, that Ptolemy uh, developed, uh, was pretty sophisticated, but it was all built around that geocentric assumption. But the thing still works, and it gets the eclipses right and stuff, even though it's built on a completely... Uh, different mathematical model than, yeah. So um, those of you who are going to take some physics uh, will will learn, of course, that no frame of reference is more privileged than any other. And so, yeah, a geocentric model is fine. That doesn't mean that that's actually how the, the heavens are laid out, uh, but the math works, so why not? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so it, it, it works. That's pretty cool. Uh, and people have tried to build recreations and there's a lot of scholarship about this, this contraption. Um, but, you know, in some sense, it was a calculator, not a computer. And we'll kind of talk about what the difference is between those. Um, you know, is there a distinction between them and why would I make such a distinction? Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, this first early history. And as far as we know, there's only one of these things ever in existence. And so, you know, there's no writings or people talking about these sorts of contraptions, um, which is, you know, kind of too bad. Uh, first thing I'll do with a time machine after killing baby Hitler, of course, and, uh, and well, and taking a sports almanac and betting a bunch uh, would be to uh, to go back and be like, all right, guys, who made this thing? Because it's really well engineered, um, especially considering ancient ancient technology. So given how sophisticated it is, like, there's no way it was a one off, right? There's just the, the, the and, and then if it were, why would you put it on a ship that was going to wreck? Right? Um, you know, why wouldn't you send an entire fleet with it to make sure it got to wherever it was supposed to go? Um, all right, so flash forward, uh, oops, uh, quite a long time. And in the 19th century, uh, industrialization starts to kind of ramp up and uh in particular a guy named jacquard 
uh, developed basically a, a semi-automated weaving loom system where you use these punched cards to basically program the pattern of uh, textile weaving. So if you wanted to have, you know, like a cloth that had some sort of pattern in it, un until then, obviously, this would all be handmade. Well, this was a way to accelerate that and also get it right, you know, perfect every time. Um, and so he came up with this idea for punched, you know, punched cards, basically. I mean, you can see them here running through the mill. Uh, therefore, who were the first programmers? All women, basically. I mean, who would be working in a, weave, a textile mill? Mostly women. Um, huh? And, well, yes, uh, back then, uh, you know, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so used punch cards. Also in the 19th century, uh, there was this guy named Charles Babbage, and uh, he had a, an assistant, uh, Ada Lovelace, uh, who was actually one of Lord Byron's daughters. Uh, so does anybody know who Lord, Lord Byron was? Yeah, poet, writer. Uh, he hang, hung out with the uh, Shelleys. Uh, Mary Shelley uh, wrote Frankenstein, so he was real in the literary world, and then went and fought in the Revolutionary War in Greece. Uh, and is like a national hero in Greece. It's, it's kind of a weird life. But his daughter, it arguably, is one of the first true computer programmers. Um, so he designed and partially built this thing called the Difference Engine. Now, he never finished it because he got an idea for something cooler, and then eventually the British government got tired of him not delivering and cut off his money, and, it, you know. Uh, but uh, maybe... 20 years ago or so, uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, the Science Museum in London, uh, they've, of course, got all of Babbage's papers in the, uh, uh, the British archives, uh, decided to see, well, could we actually build it? We've got all the drawings and the specifications and, and all of this. And so they found some rich internet dude that made way too much money uh, and got him to fund the con reconstruction and, and building of two copies of the thing. And one of them is in uh, the Science Museum in London. And the other, uh, I don't think it's still there, uh, was at the Computer History Museum in California. Um, that one was destined to become a piece of furniture in his living room. Uh, but for a while, he had it on loan at the, the Computer History Museum. Um, and they built it using known metalworking and tolerances and basically two 19th century specs uh, to see if it would have been possible for machinists of that era to actually pull it off. And it works. Uh, you can't really see this, but right over here, there's a hand crank. Um, they had to add basically a, a bar onto the hand crank so you could get a bit more torque but Babbage would have easily been able to figure that out. So you crank the thing and all these gears and rotors turn, and then this thing that's bolted onto it is a printer. Uh, and so it just prints numbers as it calculates them. Um, so the original purpose for having this thing uh, was uh, basically for navigation. So this is an art that nobody knows anymore, hardly anybody. Um, but does like does anybody happen to know how to use a sextant? And like if I handed you a compass and a sextant and said, and and a and a almanac and said, okay, figure out where on the planet you are, you'd all be SOL. Okay, there's a lot of cool math that goes into that, uh, but in particular, you need tables of pre-computed numbers uh, that are you know things from trigonometry basically. Uh, now, if you guys needed to know some sort of, you know, the sign of 37 degrees, what would you do? Yeah, you'd bust open your calculator or your phone, you'd punch it in, and bam, you'd have it to nine or ten decimal places, right? Just done, right? Well, obviously, calculators didn't exist back then, or not things that you held in your hand. Calculator was actually a job title back then, not uh, a, an object, okay? Um, so calculating and writing these things down 
after calculation to then make into a, tab a, a table that you would print in a book, well, there's several layers of error that could get introduced there, right? Computational error, transcription error when you're writing it, transcription error when it goes from written to uh, printing press, okay? Um, and so what this printer could do is not only could it calculate it perfectly to, you know, however many decimal digits you wanted, uh, but then it would print the whole thing too. And so there was zero human involvement other than turning the crank and setting up the machine initially. Um, and so they have this thing, like I said, at uh, the Science Museum and the Computer History Museum. The one in the London Science Museum is in a big glass case and you can look at it. The one at the Computer History Museum is not in a big glass case. And every afternoon at two o'clock, they give a little demonstration of it. And one of the curators cranks the handle and it prints a new row on the, the printer and you can see the whole thing work. It's really awesome. Um, I went and saw it. That was before everybody had like video cameras in their cell phones. So I don't have a video of it, but there's probably one on YouTube uh, of, of them cranking, cranking out numbers. Um, so the reason he never finished it is because he came up with another idea, which was for a thing called an analytical engine, which would genuinely be a computer uh, and be able to make decisions and um, be programmed to do stuff. And it would basically be, you know, a giant thing that included a difference engine as one of its components. He never built the whole thing. He's got parts. There's some drawings. Uh, people have made reproductions of parts of it. Nobody has yet built the whole dang thing. Uh, I mean, that would be millions upon millions of dollars to do it. And um, it was never finished in drawing either. So we're not entirely sure how the whole thing would have worked. But um, yeah. Uh, I mentioned Loveless, so she, um, you know, in some sense, you could say, wrote some of the first programs for this engine, even though it didn't actually physically exist. Um, and so what you see here is her, this is an appendix from one of her, uh, a book on the thing, uh, where she basically traces through, okay, to compute, how would the machine step-by-step -step execute trying to compute a certain kind of number or a certain sequence of numbers called Bernoulli numbers. Um, and so this isn't really a program, it's more of an execution trace, uh, but you could argue that in some sense it really is the first computer program. Uh, this page is on display at the British, uh, uh, the library, um, which is, you know, uh, of course on the other side of town from the Science Museum, but uh, it's, um, not that far, it's a short bus ride from the uh, the British Museum. Has anybody ever been to London? Yeah, did you go to the British Museum or the library or? Yeah. Okay, the museum's really cool. There's a lot of cool stuff there. The Rosetta Stone was pretty epic. Um, so even though it should be in Egypt, but whatever. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so flash forward to the 1930s and this little machine gets invented, uh, Enigma. Uh, some of you guys may have seen the movie uh, Imitation Game uh, with you know, how, uh, talking about Alan Turing and code breaking and stuff. So uh, believe it or not, the Enigma was actually a commercial product um, that the German military and government basically appropriated and then uh, used for all of their encryption. And there were a couple of different models that they used, so the nautical version was a little different, uh, you know, the uh, Kriegsmarine used a different version than the, the Wehrmacht, um, but they basically operated on the same principle. You would, hey, you had this typewriter looking keyboard, okay, and you see how this is the Z key? This is how the German keyboard layout is. It's not the same as the American, you know, English layout. Um, so you would hit a key and then one of the other lights for a letter would light up and it would be, so let's say you hit the Z, well, a different letter is gonna uh, light up and that would be what you would transmit to the recipient. Uh, and then what would happen if you hit the Z again? Would you get the same letter the second time? No. So it had these rotors and every time you hit uh, a letter, the rotor would click forward by one 
And then once the first rotor clicked through 26 positions or whatever, the next rotor would turn once. So it was kind of like an odometer in that sense. And the rotors all had little wires in them that would basically, uh, not randomly, but in a predictable uh, fashion, uh, connect the input letter to an output letter. And that would change every time you hit the button. And so what you had to do uh, to tell the recipient how to decode it was what rotor settings you used. And you would do that by saying which page of the code book. And so there was a book of codes of initial positions and stuff. You would have to transmit that in plain unciphered for them to know how to set up their rotors. And the thing was symmetric. So the brilliant part about it was decoding and encoding worked exactly the same way. If you got the scrambled message, you would type it. And so let's say that, that the, uh, the code sender hit the Z and the C key lit up. Okay. Then the recipient would type a C and their Z would light up, which is the decoded letter, right? So the same machine, would, would both decode and encode, which is great because you don't need two machines. You just have to have the rotors set up correctly. Um, and because there's so many different rotor settings, decoding, cracking this thing was exceptionally difficult mathematically, um, especially in the day because you didn't have a computer to brute force it. You, they had to design and build the computers to do this. Um, and also using uh, it's a little bit of social engineering. So if you get a hold of one of the code books, you're you're in business until they replace all the code books, with the, which the military did pretty frequently. Um, the naval version had an extra rotor because it's a little harder to send a code book to a U-boat that's out to, at sea. So those weren't replaced as often. But if you captured a U-boat or you know some other a German unit that had one of these things and they didn't destroy it before they got you, then you could you know presumably be able to uh, decode messages uh, and that along with some pretty sophisticated mathematics meant that we could we could crack uh, some number of these messages and know what the Germans were up to during the war um, yeah so um, these things uh, there's not a whole lot of them out there but there's still some they go for a pretty penny uh, the I go to a conference every January for, you know, mathematicians and um, the National Security Agency uh, always has a big booth set up because they hire, as you know, my guess, a lot of mathematicians uh, to crack codes and stuff. But they actually bring their enigma in a box uh, and let, you know, do demonstrations at their booth and you can type a message and they keep it in working order. It's really neat. Um, and... Uh, they take it through airport security and, you know, the TSA guys are like, no, you can't take this through. And then they have to pull out their NSA IDs and say, yes, yes, we can. Um, so, yeah, uh, they say we don't normally like to flash our badges around and be, you know, badasses about it. But every now and then you just have to shut somebody down. Um, so a lot of that work happened at Bletchley Park, um, which is in England. And uh, a lot of it was headed up by this guy, Alan Turing, um, who, has anybody heard of him before? Yeah. Um, who, in many respects, you could call it kind of the father of computer science, the discipline of it. Um, and uh, so he, you know, basically led the, the British effort to decode this thing. They had a lot of Polish mathematicians that had fled from Poland after the Nazis invaded. Um, and so there's this giant, you know, operation going on at Bletchley Park to, to, to crack these things. Um, anybody know a little bit of the history of, of uh, Turing? Huh? He was gay. And that was a crime in England at the time. Uh, and so they found out about it. And they offered him two options. You can either go to prison or submit to hormone injections to lower your libido. He took the latter. And then eventually said, F this, and killed himself. Laced with cyanide. And there's some speculation that you guys know the Apple computer logo, that's an apple with a little bite taken out of it, that that's why they put the, did the bite as a homage to Turing. Um, yeah, and it wasn't until oh, about 20 years ago or so that the British government finally formally apologized for the whole matter. 
Um, but uh, yeah, and he is also now on the 50 pound note, uh, uh, which I have one in my office uh, in a little like glass case uh, that, does anybody know Rob Shook, class of 83? No, yeah, he gave it to me. Uh, so yeah, um, okay, so in the state side, there was uh, this machine that was being built during the war called the ENIAC. Um, and uh, it was an electronic machine. Uh, there was actually a guy in Germany designing uh, and building computers, and arguably he got the first one built, electric. Uh, it used telephone relays as switches um, and a lot of electricity, um, but he didn't get, he got some funding from the Germans, but not enough because essentially Hitler thought he would have won the war before this contraption got finished. And so it wouldn't actually help the war. Um, and so he put his money elsewhere, like with uh, Werner von Braun to uh, develop rockets and you know stuff like that. Um, but yeah, this was going on stateside. It used vacuum tubes for switches, which is uh, something we don't really use anymore unless is anybody like a you know super high-end audiophile, like you've got record players and stuff. Um, sometimes they still use uh, vacuum tubes because of the, the quality of sound that they produce. Um, but nowadays we don't use them anymore. It's, they're essentially about the size of a light bulb or maybe a large light bulb, depending on how uh, much power they're supposed to use. Um, and uh, I mean, maybe you guys are getting a little bit too young, but uh, does anybody remember having to swap light bulbs all the time because they'd burn out? the incandescent ones before you got the little spiral CFLs or now, of course, LED bulbs, right, that last longer than the lamp you put them in. Um, yeah, back in the day, of course, if a light bulb made it six months, you were like, yay. And so uh, vacuum tubes being essentially light bulbs, slightly different, they'd burn out and you'd have to replace them. And so... Uh, you would go to drug stores back in the day, like you'd go to your, you know, Walgreens, and they'd have tube testers and a rack of tubes on a shelf, and you'd just be like, oh, yep, it is in fact bad, and then, you know, okay, here's the replacement for this model number or whatever, and then you'd go and put it back in your radio, and oh, then you were good. Um, so, uh, yeah, drug stores were different back in the day. They usually had soda fountains and ice cream and it's like a social thing to go to them. Different era. Um, one of the pioneers of the American computing field in, during World War II uh, was this lady, Grace Hopper. Uh, she was a math professor at Vassar College. And when the war broke out, she joined the Navy and they commissioned her as an officer. And she worked on ENIAC and, and other computational uh, or computer projects. Uh, and then ended up being the oldest person ever to be on active duty in the military. So this is a picture of her in the 1980s uh, as a uh, rear admiral, uh, then Commodore, but uh, the rank of Commodore no longer exists in the Navy, so it's a rear admiral lower half. Um, basically what happened is she would retire, and then they would be doing something, and they would get stuck, and they wouldn't be able to figure it out. And they'd bring her out of retirement to come fix it. Uh, and that's not, it's a mild exaggeration, but not, not huge. Um, yeah, so she was really important. Um, the vacuum tubes, as you could imagine, kind of sucked because they'd burn out all the time, right? And if you had thousands of these things, the odds of all thousand of them working all at the same time, there was always going to be one burnt out. Okay, so you can imagine that this sort of put a limit on what you could do with a computer. You couldn't have millions of them because it would never work. Uh, but then Bell Labs came up with this little thing in the late 40s, the transistor, which is a solid state thing, and uh, it doesn't burn out like a vacuum tube does. It's also a hell of a lot smaller and uses way less energy. And uh, so this was first invented in, at uh, Bell Labs in 1947, and here it is. Um, then over the next basically decade, the, the ability to manufacture these things cheaper, better, 
figuring out how to make new different uh, new kinds, uh, etc. Ones that were more res resilient uh, started to come out. And so you, the first application of these things was used as a um, as an amplifier. Okay, same thing with the vacuum tube, by the way. But it can also be used as a switch, and we'll talk about how that works later. Um, and so the very first uh, commercial application of these things were in radios. Okay, so transistor radios could be a lot smaller, and eventually pocket sized. You could take a radio with you, um, and uh, that you know revolutionized things. Uh, and of course, it was invented by these guys. Um, and uh, then later, they figured out, okay, what about if we make a circuit really tiny, if we have, can find a way to miniaturize and make the whole circuit at once? Okay, so thus the integrated circuit was born, and this is what you, they would look like to you today. Uh, these have a circle cut in the top of the casing. So the actual integrated circuit is that tiny thing there. That's only a few millimeters by a few millimeters, okay? And this chip would be, you know, maybe roughly the size of the first two knuckles of one of your fingers, roughly, not huge, okay? But you could pack millions upon millions of transistors into a tiny, tiny little area which meant that you could compute with a lot less power and do a lot more with it. Um, and, um, you know, thus the, the sort of, the, the, these enabled uh, miniaturized computers to be, uh, to start to be created, okay? So in the 1950s, a computer took up a room this size, okay? How many of you guys have seen hidden figures? Okay, you guys remember the scene in the computing thing when they, they have to get it into the room and the door's not big enough, right? Okay, so that was the computer in those days. It took up, you know, it's a bunch of modules that took up a large room, okay? In uh, integrated circuits enabled that all to be condensed into something, a, what we call a mini computer, that would be like the size of a, ref of a refrigerator roughly, okay? Still pretty dang big, but it's not gonna take up an entire room, okay? Uh, advances in integrated circuits then allowed for microcomputers, which are things that could sit comfortably on your desk, okay? So here's a picture of an Apple I uh, from the uh, mid 70s, okay? Uh, and Apple sold this as a kit of parts and you had to assemble the whole thing yourself and build your own case, um, which, you know, back then, the only people that did computing were hobbyists that were, like, okay with putting it together themselves. They sold it for $666, by the way. Um, Apple computer, right? They were, Steve Jobs was kind of a, had a sense of humor, right? Uh, and $666 in the 70s was a lot of money right? Uh, it's way, you know, several thousand today, probably. Okay. So, um, so Apple, um, then in the eighties, a couple of things happened. So in the 19, well, 1977 is kind of what we refer to as the dawn of the, the microcomputer era. Okay. Because three computers got released that year by three different companies, the Apple II, the TRS-80, by TRS stands for Tandy Radio Shack. Anybody remember Radio Shack? Yeah, okay, well, they used to be a big deal back in the day, okay? And they had a line of computers and the Commodore PET, uh, which was by a third company. Uh, later, in, and, and these things advanced. So the Apple II line uh, developed over time and they sold a gajillion of these things, especially to schools. Okay, so people my age remember using Apple IIs in schools. Um, and in the early 80s, uh, successors to these machines were released, uh, including this one. So this is a Commodore 64. Okay, has anybody ever used one of these before? You have? Yeah. 
Yeah, because I'll show you, I'll, I've got a simulator for it. I'll show you how it boots up. Okay, so, you know, you guys are used to like graphic interfaces and a mouse that you point and click with. None of that had been invented yet. Okay, the other thing is how did you put pro load programs onto them? You had to use one of these things. Has anybody seen one of these? Yeah, okay, and if any of you little, you know, pipsqueaks say, hey, look, you 3D printed a save icon, I'm gonna punch you, okay? I'm not that old, damn it. Um, so this is a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, okay, which was uh, the standard in the, the, until the late 80s, when we switched to three and a half inches uh, floppy disks, which were rigid plastic and a little bit more robust. They could also store more data. Uh, the original floppy disks were eight inches, okay? So, you know, it'd be like about yay big or so. Uh, they are still in use today and they are still manufactured today. Okay, and there's a company, I'll actually pull up their website because this is kind of hilarious. By this company, Athena, okay? All right, now, this is the very important line. Athena International is an authorized federal supplier. For GSA information, go to the GSA page, okay? Why do you think the federal government still needs floppies? Okay, so like, let's go to diskettes, right? They've got the three and a half, five and a quarter, and eight inch diskettes. They still make them. You can buy them new. Buy, you know, the pallet if you want. Why would the US government still need eight inch floppies, pray tell? What do you think runs all the nuclear equipment? Particularly the nuclear launch silos. Because I don't know about you guys, but I don't want my nuclear weapons controlled by Windows 10. Okay. Uh, A, and B, I've seen plenty of movies to know that you do not connect nuclear weapons to the internet. Okay. I mean, that's like the whole premise of the Terminator series. Right. So it's security through obscurity, right? You have to physically be in the silo. And, you know, it's got the whole, like, there's two keys that have to be switched, turned simultaneously, and they're 12 feet apart, so there's no way that one person could do it, uh, right? There's all this crazy, you know, nuclear stuff. But, yeah, the 8-inch floppies, <coughs> excuse me, are still used in nuclear launch uh, equipment. Um, and may we hope we never have to use those, okay? Um, yeah, but in particular, right, when I need floppies, where am I going to go? I'm going to get their stuff because it's reliable, it's still good, and if it's good enough for nuclear launch equipment, it's gonna be good enough for me. Okay, so Commodore 64, um, it was called the Commodore 64 because it had 64 kilobytes of RAM. That's it, right? The entire computer, okay? That's not a whole lot, right? And one of these floppy disks could store about 180 kilobytes worth of data, okay? Um, this is the, not this particular one, but the Commodore 64 was the first computer I ever used when I was a child. Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint because we're almost out of time today. Um, and just talk about a couple things. Uh, the Macintosh was released in 1984. There's an epic commercial that they put out during the Super Bowl in 1984 to announce its release. It is probably one of the best commercials ever made, period. Okay, so go watch it. Um, on YouTube, it's really cool. Uh, and then the computers got the size of refrigerators again, but these are the supercomputers, right? So IBM has, you know, Roadrunner, there's lots of other ones. Uh, and then we started to get the GPU revolution. Uh, graphics cards, the way that they work is particularly well suited for certain kinds of computations, like mining Ethereum, um, but until it goes proof of stake next month and then no more mining, um, but uh, it's, you know, in scientific applications and machine learning and stuff. And so, you know, where would you use that? Oh, well, if you want a self-driving car, you need a neural network and these things are trained and executed on GPUs. So graphics, uh, that kind of processor. Okay, that was a hopelessly incomplete overview of 2000 years of history. Um, and we'll go through all of it in way more detail. Well, maybe not all of it. I'm not gonna like hand you guys a bunch of Lego gears and say, build me an any kid for a mechanism. Although that would be pretty damn cool. 
Um, so yeah, all right, have a good one. And I will post your first assignment. Uh, there's one already up there, which is to watch a, a series of documentaries that were made in the early 90s. Um, and then I'm gonna have you guys get write me an essay about your history with computers. Like what have you done with computers and stuff? So, all right, see you guys next time.